Section 14 of the American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean MacDonald. The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. The Cloudbursters by Francis Lynde. Part 2. On the morning following Sprague's visit to the Tribune editorial rooms, the newspaper reading public of Brewster had a small sensation served in Starbuck's phrase, hot from the skillet. A good portion of the front page of the Tribune was given to a news story of the work which was under way in the Mesquite Valley, and pictures were printed of the camp, the dam, and the growing lake. On the editorial page was a caustic arraignment of the Mesquite Company which was called upon to show cause why it should not be condemned as a public nuisance, of a kind which had already brought much reproach upon the West as a field for legitimate investment. And the suggestion was made that a committee of responsible citizens be sent to investigate the Mesquite project, to the end that the charges made might be either substantiated or set aside. Specifically, these charges were that there was no arable land within reach of the Mesquite Dam, and that the dam itself was unsafe. Throughout his editorial, Kendall had judiciously refrained from making any mention of a possible disaster to the railroad, but he hinted broadly at the danger to which the High Line Dam, the source of the city's power and lights, would be subjected in the event of a flood catastrophe on the distant project. Maxwell, who was living at the hotel in the absence of his family, had read the paper before he came down to join Sprague at the breakfast table, and, like every other newspaper reader and Brewster that morning, he was full of the latest sensation. "'By George, Calvin,' he began, "'somebody has been stirring up the mud for those people we were talking about night before last. Have you seen the Tribune?' Sprague nodded assent. "'Well, what do you make of it?' asked the railroad man. "'I should say that somebody, possibly the high-line management, is beginning to sit up and take notice, wouldn't you?' "'Yes. But see here. Any such thing as Kendall hints at would knock the Nevada short line out long before it would get to the High Line Dam.' "'Naturally,' said Sprague coolly. "'Great Jehu! Was that what you meant when you were making me dig this mesquite project over for you the other day?' "'I didn't want to drag you into it.' "'And don't yet,' said Sprague quietly. You've had grief enough for one summer, but the detective half of me tells me that there is little doubt that this thing is another attempt on the part of the big money crowd to sideswipe your railroad off the map. It can be done, and you have no preventive recourse. Stilling says you haven't. But, Calvin, something's got to be done. Are we going to sit still and— One kind of a something is doing itself right now, interrupted Sprague. It's your play this time to keep out of it if you can. You'd say that the High Line people, J. Montague Smith and his crowd, inspired that blast in the Tribune this morning, wouldn't you? It looks that way, yes. Well, let them stir up the mud and make the fight. You sit tight in the boat and say nothing. What kind of an agent or operator have you at Angles? Disbrow? He's a good man. So good that I'm going to promote him to a better station next week. Let that promotion wait a while. Give this good man instructions to watch every move that Jennings makes and to report at once anything out of the ordinary that may happen. Do you get that? I'll do it. Anything else? No, not at present. Later on, say... After the evening edition of the Times record comes out, I may want to get you on a quick wire, but the chief thing just now is to post the Angles man, and to have him keep in touch with you. After Maxwell had gone, the chemistry expert finished his breakfast with epicurean leisure, smoked a reflective cigar in comfortable solitude in the hotel lobby, and when the court hour arrived, went around to the office of the Justice of the Peace to answer to the charge of assault. As was to be expected, Jennings was not present was not even represented by an attorney. Sprague pleaded guilty and paid his nominal fine, which McFarland took with a quiet smile. 
I don't know what you did to that black-faced bully, Mr. Sprague, but I hope you got your money's worth, he said. Every time he turns up here in Brewster, he proves himself an undesirable citizen, right from the word go. Tough, is he? queried Sprague. As tough as they make them. I wonder he didn't try to get square with you with a gun. That would be more like him. Perhaps he will later on, suggested the find one with a good-natured smile, after which he went across to his laboratory and was invisible for the remainder of the morning. Just before noon Stillings dropped into the laboratory office. He found the chemist working among his retorts and test tubes. I fell in to give you a pointer, was the attorney's excuse for the intrusion. Jennings is in town. He came over on the ten o'clock local and went straight to the Times record office. Spray grinned. You were looking out for him, were you? Somebody got waked up at last? Yes. The Highline people are on, all right, was the reply. Smith called an emergency meeting of his directors early this morning. Two of them are red desert cattle barons, and they know the mesquite situation like a book. What none of them can understand is the why. Why the mesquite outfit should take ninety-nine chances in a hundred of sending a flood down the Timignani when there's no money to be made by it. What action did the director's meeting take? instructed me to field Judge Watson on the question of holding things up with an injunction. I did it, and it turned out as you intimated it would. Nothing doing. Smith asked me to borrow Maxwell's special officer, Arch Tarbell, suggesting that we ought to keep in touch with Jennings. Archer was going over to Angles on the afternoon train, but Jennings has saved him the trouble by coming to town. Well, what next? Sprague inquired. "'That is just what I'd like to ask you,' was the lawyer's frank admission. "'We're all looking to you to set the pace. You're the one man with the holy gift of initiative, Mr. Sprague. You haven't admitted it in so many words, but I know as well as I know anything that you are the man who started this newspaper talk.' "'Shaw,' said the expert in genial raillery. "'I'm—' Only a government chemist, Mr. Stillings. That's all right, too. But that isn't why the railroad men call you Scientific Sprague. Four times this summer you've dug Maxwell and his railroad out of a hole when the rest of us didn't know there was any hole. What I'm most afraid of now is that Jennings will put up some sort of a scheme to get you out of the way. He knows well enough by this time that you are the key to his situation. I'm a tenderfoot, said the big man with naive irony. What would you suggest? That you go to Sheriff Harding and get him to swear you in as a special deputy. Then you can be prepared to defend yourself. Sprague's mellow laugh rumbled deep in his big body. I guess I can take care of myself if it comes to that without packing hardware, Starbuck would put it, he averred. There won't be more than three or four of them to tackle me at once, will there? But about your campaign. I have been hoping that the high-lying people, backed by public sentiment, would be able to head this thing off. I am still hoping it. It will be altogether better if the railroad doesn't have to take a hand on its own account. The New Yorkers would be sure to make capital out of it holding the Ford-Maxwell management up to public execration as a corporation which deliberately strangles development propositions in its own territory. That's a fact, the attorney agreed. Working along that line, we can afford to wait, for a little while at least, to see how the cat is going to jump. Jennings is over here to get into the newspaper fight himself. In Maxwell's demoralization tussle of two weeks ago, it was demonstrated that the Times record had been subsidized by the enemy. Now we shall see Higginson and his editor jump in and take up the clubs in defense of the Mesquite Company. I guess that is pretty good advice to wait, said Stillings. 
but we have an active crowd in the high line. Its blood is up. Our people will want to be doing something while they wait. Let them talk, said Sprague quickly. Tell them to resolve themselves into committees of one, to throw the big scare into the Brewster public, which depends upon the safety of the High Line Dam for its own safety. Then pick out a few good, dependable men, like Smith, his old fighting father-in-law, the Colonel, and Williams, the engineer, who will hold themselves in readiness to start at a moment's notice, night or day, for the firing line, any firing line that may happen to show up. That is more like it, rejoined the attorney. I'm sworn to hold up the majesty of the law, but, but as you remarked last night, there are extra judicial crises now and then which have to be met in any old way that offers. Let it rest at that, and see me at the hotel this evening, if you can make it convenient. With the appearance on the streets of the evening edition of the Times record, the Brewster public learned that there were two sides to the mesquite question. In terms of unmeasured scorn, Editor Healy attacked the narrow prejudice which would seek to place stumbling blocks in the way of a great enterprise designed to benefit not only the region locally concerned, but the entire West. In the course of a long and vituperative editorial, the High Line Company, the Brewster Public Service Corporations, and the Railroad each came in for its share of accusation, and their joint lack of public spirit was roundly condemned. It was pointed out that the High Line plant, by the admission of its own officials, would be in no danger even in the unsupposable case of the breaking of the Mesquite Dam. Also, it was urged that the Pennywise policy of the railroad in adopting the low grade in Timignani Canyon was a matter of its own risk. Was the development of the nation to be halted, it was asked, because a niggardly railroad company was unwilling to spend a little money in raising its grade beyond a possible danger line. But the sting of the editorial for Maxwell was in its tail. Healy concluded by darkly hinting that certain of the railroad officials were interested financially in sundry Temignani parklands owned by the High Line Company, and that they were willing to kill the prospects of the new district for the sake of their own pockets. Maxwell was furiously hot about this blast in the evening paper, as his demeanor at the dinner table where he spoke his mind freely to Sprague sufficiently proved. Why, the miserable liars! he raged. There isn't an official on the short line from President Ford down who owns a single share of stock in the high line. We all did help out at first, but Ford made every man of us turn loose the minute the dam was completed and the project was securely on its feet. He insisted that we couldn't afford to work for two dividend accounts. He was quite right, said Sprague calmly. But that is neither here nor there. It was Jennings' turn at bat, and he took it, let it go. And tell me what you hear from that good and reliable man, Disbrow, at Angles. I had him on the wire myself just a few minutes ago, was the superintendent's answer. He says something has stirred things up over on the Mesquite. The working night shifts began last night. Rain? queried the expert. How the devil do you manage to jump at things that way? demanded Maxwell, half irritably. Yes, there have been cloudbursts in the eastern foothills. The river rose two feet today. Ah. That may bring on more talk, before the stenographers are ready to take it down. Any more items from Angles? Nothing special. The Mesquite people got to have a carload of dynamite this morning. And that shows you how careful Disbrow is. He's spotting everything, even the common routine things. Um, dynamite, eh? What uses Jennings for so much high explosive as that? I don't know. Uses it in excavating, I suppose. The more he uses, the bigger his rake-off from the powder company. Where there's a big graft, there's always a lot of little ones. Sprague ate in silence for five full minutes before he said, quite without preliminary, How long would it take a light special train to run from Brewster to Angles with a clear track and regardless orders, Dick? I made it once in my own car in two hours and fifty-five minutes, with two stops for water. Why? Oh, I was just curious to know. Two fifty-five, eh? 
And how long would it take to get the special train ready? Fifteen or twenty minutes, perhaps, on a rush order? Sprague sat back and began to fold his napkin carefully in the original creases. As I have said before, I don't want to pose as an alarmist, Maxwell. But if I were you, I'd have that special train hooked up and ready to pull out. And I'd keep it that way, on tap, so to speak. The railroad man rose to the occasion promptly. Beginning tonight? he asked. Yes, beginning tonight. Has Jennings gone back? He has. He went over on the evening train. Your man Tarbell kept cases on him while he was here. He spent most of the day with Higginson and Healy in the Times Record Office. Maxwell refused his dessert and ordered a second cup of black coffee. This suspense is something fierce, Calvin, he said when the waiter left them. Have we got to sit still and do nothing? That is your part in it, was the quiet reply. If a party of prominent citizens should call upon you for a special train at some odd hour of the day or night, you want to be ready to supply it suddenly. Aside from that, you are to keep hands off. For forty-eight hours beyond this evening dinner in the Topaz Café, two days during which the railroad agent at Angles reported increased activity at the Mesquite Dam, the newspaper wrangle over the merits and demerits of the irrigation project in the edge of the Red Desert went on with growing acrimony on both sides. But by the end of the second day it was apparent that the Tribune had public sentiment with it almost unanimously. It was also on the second day that further bitterness was engendered by a street report that Judge Watson had enjoined the Highline Company from interfering in any way with the operations on the Mesquite. This was the last straw and public indignation found expression that night in a monster mass meeting of protest in which the speakers with j montague smith to set them the example criticized the court sharply in free western phrase after the meeting adopting all sorts of resolutions condemnatory of everything in sight adjourned which was between nine and ten o'clock there was a street rumor to the effect that judge watson would declare some of the speakers in contempt and cinch them accordingly Maxwell and Starbuck brought this report to Sprague, who was smoking one of his big black cigars on the porch of the hotel. "'Going to institute contempt proceedings, is he?' said the expert, with interest only half aroused. "'Wouldn't that jar you?' commented Starbuck. "'I was telling Dick just now that Judge Watson has about outlived his usefulness in this little old shack town.' This injunction of his is about the rawest thing that ever came over the range. Smith is red hot, Maxwell put in. Hot enough to get out and scrap somebody. And his directors are all with him. Still the big-bodied expert seemed only mildly interested. If anybody should happen to get mixed up legally with the mesquite folks on this job of theirs it would be pretty hard to get a jury in brewster which would lean the way the judge does wouldn't it he asked maxwell's verdict was unqualified it would be practically impossible he had found his pipe and was filling it when sprague pointed to the spur track at the end of the railroad building opposite is that your special train over there dick yes you see, I've obeyed orders. That train has been standing there for two days, with three shifts of men dividing up the watch in the engine cab. And the Committee of Prominent Citizens hasn't yet materialized, eh? Never mind, you've done your part. What is the latest from Angles? More cloud bursts in the hills and more activity up on the mesquite. Disbrow says that Jennings has been offering all sorts of big pay to the scattered ranchmen to get them to come on the job with scraper teams. That's bad, said the chemistry man briefly, adding, I don't like that. Starbuck got up to stand with his back to a porch pillar. From the new position, he could look through the windows into the thronged hotel lobby. This town stirred up some hotter than I've ever seen it before, he drawled. Look at that mob inside and every blame man of it chewing the rag over this water proposition. I don't like that, Sprague repeated. 
thus proving that he'd entirely missed Starbuck's comment on the excitement. Then he sat up suddenly. "'There's a boy just coming down from your offices, Maxwell. It's the night watchman's boy, isn't it? Run across and head him, Starbuck. I believe that's a telegram he has in his hand.' Starbuck swung himself over the railing and caught the lad before he could disappear in the street throngs. "'You were plumb right,' he said, when he came back to take his place on the porch. "'He did have a message. It's for Dick. Here you are.' Maxwell tore the envelope across and held the telegram up to the ceiling light. "'Here's news,' he announced. "'It's from our man at Angles. He says, "'Jennings is forced disbanded, and most of it gone east on Limited, been shipping teams and outfit all afternoon, too busy to wire sooner.' The superintendent crumbled the telegram and smote fist into palm. "'Bully for you, Sprague,' he exulted. "'You pushed the right button just right. Jennings couldn't stand the pressure. He's given up the job and quit.' There was no answering enthusiasm on the part of the big man, who rose suddenly out of his chair and reached for the telegram. Quite the contrary, the hand which took the crumpled bit of paper was trembling a little. "'Dick,' he began, in his deepest chest tone, "'you hike over to the dispatcher's office on the dead run and have Connolly clear for that special train. Don't lose a minute. Starbuck, it's up to you to find Smith, Tarbell, Williams, Colonel Baldwin, and two or three more good men whom you can trust, trust absolutely, mind you. Herd your crowd at the station in the quickest possible time. And you, Maxwell, make it your first business to tell the agent at Angles that there is a special train coming over the road. Don't tell him its destination. Just say it will leave Brewster going east in a few minutes. Don't slip up on that. It may mean a dozen human lives. Get busy, both of you. After he was left alone, Sprague shouldered a path through the crowd in the lobby and had himself lifted to his rooms. When he came down a few minutes later he had changed his business clothes for the field rig which he wore on his soil-collecting expeditions. He had scarcely worked his way through the throng to the comparative freedom of the porch when Maxwell came hurrying across from the railroad building. "'Bad luck,' said the superintendent, with brittle emphasis. "'There's a freight train off the steel halfway between Corona and Timignani this side of the canyon, and the track is blocked. And we can't get by. There's nothing on the other side of the wreck that you could order down to meet us at the block. Nothing nearer than Angles. There is an eastbound freight held there, loading the last of Jennings' outfit. To order the engine back from that would add at least an hour and a half to the two-hour, fifty-minute running schedule I gave you the other day. Sprague swore, out of a full heart, which, since he was the least profane of men, was an accurate measure of his growing disquietude. "'That's on me,' he grated. "'I had it all figured out to the tenth decimal place, and I didn't put in the factor of chance. "'Dick, I want the biggest automobile in this town, and the one man among all your thousands who is least afraid to drive it.' Maxwell was able to answer without hesitation. And "'The car will be Colonel Baldwin's big six, with Starbuck for your reckless chauffeur.' "'but I doubt if you can get over the range in anything that goes on wheels.' "'Then he added, "'What is it, Calvin? What have you figured out?' "'Sprague ignored the anxious query and spoke only to the fact. "'Can't get over the range. "'I tell you, we've got to get over the range. "'Good Lord! Why in heaven's name doesn't Starbuck hurry?' "'Starbuck had hurried. "'He had looked to find most, if not all of the men he had been told to summon.' closeted in conference with Stillings, and his guess had gone true to the mark. Only Tarbell was missing, and him they picked up in front of the Tribune office, as they were hurrying to the rendezvous in the Colonel's big touring car. Maxwell saw the car as it came under the corner electrics. "'There's a little luck, anyway,' he exclaimed. "'That is the Colonel's car now, and Billy is driving it.' "'Tools and arms, half a dozen picks and shovels, and anything you can find that will shoot,' commanded Sprague vaulting the porch railing to the sidewalk as easily as Starbuck had vaulted it a little while before. See to that part of the outfit yourself, Dick, while I'm looking after the human end of it. One minute afterward, the big man was standing beside the touring car which had been drawn up at the townside platform of the railroad building. Sprague shot the emergency at the five men in the car in bullet-like sentences. Gentlemen, we've got to get over to the Mesquite as quick as the Lord will let us. The railroad is blocked and it's an auto or nothing. Maxwell says we can't do it. I say we've got to do it. What do you say? 
I reckon we can do it, drawled Starbuck, speaking for all. Then he turned to Smith, who was in the tonneau. How about the tanks, Monty? I filled them tonight before we left the ranch, said the Highline treasurer. Also, there's an extra gallon of oil aboard. We always carry it. How about it, Colonel? Sprague demanded of the erect, white-mustached old man in the back seat. Sure, was the quick reply. You haven't told us yet whether it's a fight or frolic, but we're all with you either way, Mr. Sprague. Hop in, and we'll be jogging along. It was at this moment that Maxwell, followed by a couple of yard men, came up. The men were carrying the picks and shovels, which were hastily stowed in the car, and the superintendent handed over a small arsenal of weapons, three of them being sawed off Winchesters. I had to raid the express office, he explained, and I took what I could find. Then to Sprague, who had mounted to the seat beside Starbuck. Don't you want me along? No. You can do a great deal more good right here. Listen now, and follow my directions to the letter. Go upstairs to the wire and get in touch with your man at Angles. It will be your job to keep him in doubt as to what is on the road between his station and the lower end of the canyon. Lie to him if you have to. Uh, tell him a part of the wrecked freight is on its way up the canyon or something of that sort, and keep him believing it as long as you possibly can. Don't fall down on it. Everything depends now upon the length of time you can keep some such story as that going over the wires. Starbuck had adjusted a pair of goggles to his eyes, and had his foot on the clutch pedal. All set? he asked. Go, said Sprague, and at the word the big car shot away from the platform, rounded the end of the plaza, and bore away through the cross street to the eastward, gathering headway until, when the city limits were passed, its cut-out exhausts were blending in a deafening roar. Sprague was the only member of the party who had not at some time in the past had experience with Starbucks driving, but before the first ten-mile lap on the Mesa Road had been covered, he, too, had had his initiation. There was a little lamp on the dash which poured its tiny ray on the dial of the speedometer. Sprague saw the index pointer go up to thirty-five, jump to forty, crawl steadily onward until it had passed the forty-five, and was mounting to fifty. After that he saw no more, for the simple reason that he was obliged to close his unprotected eyes against the hurricane-speed blast. The big man from Washington had asked for the fastest car in Brewster and for a man who was not afraid to drive it. He had got both. At the same time, alarming as the pace might seem, Starbuck was not taking any needless chances. He knew his road, and knew also that there were many miles of it among the mountains that would have to be taken at slower speed. Nonetheless, when the long mesa stretch was covered, and the big car was making zigzags up the precipitous slopes of Mount Cornell to reach the gap called Navajo Notch, the pace was still terrific, and the sober-faced driver was leaning over his wheel and pushing the motor like a true speed maniac. There was an hour of this risky zigzagging, and then the pass, lying cold and grim in the half-moonlight at altitude ten thousand feet, was reached and threaded. Following the summit gaining came the down-mountain rush, on the eastern slope, and again Spray closed his eyes, confessing inwardly that the steadiest nerve may have its limitations. With precipices shooting skyward on the right, and plunging sheer to unknown depths on the left, and with a man at the wheel who had apparently hypnotized himself until he had become a mere machine driving a machine. When Sprague opened his eyes, the great car was once more on an even keel, and its wheels were spurning the hard red sand of the desert. In the far distance ahead, a light was twinkling, the lamp in the station office at Angles. Sprague spoke to the iron-nerved driver at his side. Hold on, Billy. Can you make the remainder of the run without the lamps? Starbuck brought the big machine to a stand, and leaned over and extinguished the lights. A little later, under Sprague's directions, he was making a silent circuit of the town, with the muffler in, and the engine speeded at its quietest. Since it was far past midnight, the better part of Angles was abed and asleep, with lights showing only at the railroad station and in Pete Grimm's dance hall, where, arguing from the row of hitched horses, a roundup of red desert cowboys made merry. Sprague stopped the car with a sign to Starbuck and turned to Tarble. Get out, Archer, and make a quick run over to the station. I want to know what's going on in Disbrow's office. 
Tarbo made the reconnaissance and was back in a few minutes. Disbrow is at his wire, with a man walking the floor behind him, and there's a piebald bronc hitched out beyond the freight shed, was the brief report. Who is the floor walker? asked Sprague. I couldn't get a fair squint at him, but he looked mildly like the fellow I've been keeping cases on for the last two or three days. Gentlemen, we're in luck for once, Sprague said impressively. That's Jennings, without a doubt, and he is waiting for a wire, the right kind of wire, to come from Brewster. You remember what I told Maxwell as we were leaving. That was one time when a guess was as good as a prophecy. Go on, Billy, and head straight for the mesquite, and you gentlemen back there, get your weapons ready. If there happens to be a guard at the dam, we'll have to rush it. Singularly enough, when the short run was accomplished, they found that there was no guard. The shack camp was deserted, with all the disorder of a hasty evacuation strewn broadcast. But in the valley itself there was a startling change. The lake, which, three days earlier, had reached only halfway up the earth embankment, was now lapping within a foot of the dam top, the result of the continued storms and cloud bursts reported by the Brewster weather station. Starbuck eased the big car up the dam head, and Williams and Tarbell made a quick quartering of the deserted camp. "'Nobody here,' the engineer reported, when they came back to the car, and then Sprague asked Starbuck to relight the headlamps. With the acetylenes flinging their broad white beam across the earthwork, another change was made apparent. In the center of the dam a square pit, plank-lined like the shaft of a mine, had been either sunk or left in the building. Over this pit stood a three-legged hoist, with the block and tackle still hanging from its apex. "'What is that thing out there?' queried the colonel, shading his eyes with his hand. "'Jennings would probably tell you that it is a new kind of spillway by which, in case of need, the reservoir lake can be emptied,' suggested Sprague. "'But we haven't time to investigate it just now. Our job at the present moment is to take the law into our hands and empty the lake, and to do it, if we can, without bringing on the catastrophe it was designed to accomplish. "'Heavens!' ejaculated Colonel Baldwin. "'That's a criminal offense, isn't it? And in the face of Judge Watson's injunction at that—' "'It is criminal,' was the calm reply. "'Unless we shall find sufficient justification for it as we go along, there is one chance in a dozen that we may find it first. Tubble, take this little flashlight of mine, and skip out there and look into that pit. Tubble paused scarcely a moment at the mouth of the mid dam shaft. It's filled up to within a few feet of the top with dirt, he said when he returned. That is what I expected. We may find another warrant for what we are about to do, but we haven't time to search for it. Jennings may come back at any minute and if he suspects anything wrong, he'll bring that bunch of dance hall cowmen with him. If you'd like to hide in the car and stand aside to see what we will do when he comes— By Jove, I'm with you, injunction or no injunction, cried Smith, and he began to take the picks and shovels out of the car. Go to it, said the colonel, and Sprague turned to Williams. Mr. Williams, you're an engineer. Our problem is— to drain this lake in the shortest possible time in which it can be done without raising a dangerous flood level in the Timignani River. We're under your orders. Williams took to the job as a dog snaps at a fly, barking out his directions with the curt precision of a man who knew his business. Planks were brought from the dismantled shacks to be thrust down on the inward face of the dam as a protection, and these were weighted in place with a makeshift buttressing built out of the bags of sand which had been used as temporary coffer dams in the construction work. When all was ready, a small ditch was opened across the protected end of the dam, and the water began to pour through. Immediately the wisdom of William's precaution became evident. Instantly the rushing stream began to eat into the loosely built dam, threatening to turn the ditch into a gully and the gully into a chasm. And quick work was necessary with more planks and sandbags to check the rapid widening of the spillway. Even at that, the ditch grew swiftly deeper, and more cavernous as the torrent emptied itself through it, and the roar of the artificial cataract filled the air with a note of sustained thunder. "'Jennings'll be deaf if he doesn't hear this plumb down at the railroad,' shouted Tarble. But there was no time to consider the consequences Jennings-wise. Every man of the six, including the colonel, 
was constrained to work like mad to prevent the catastrophe they were trying to avert. It was when the flood was pouring through the gap in a solid six-foot stream that shot itself far out to fall in a thunderous deluge upon the barren mesquite mesa, and the planking and sandbagging was sufficing to hold it measurably within bounds, that Sprague took steps looking toward a defensive battle should the need arise. Under his direction the auto was drawn out to one side and the lamps were extinguished. Then a hasty breastwork was made of the remaining bags of sand, and Tarbell and Starbuck were sent out as skirmishers to keep watch on the Angles Road, while the others renewed their efforts to hold the pouring torrent within safe limits. A toiling half-hour, during which the spillway flood had slowly grown in volume until it threatened to become a destroying crevice, slipped away, and at the end of it the two scouts came hurrying in. "'They are coming!' yelled Starbuck, and once again the big man from the east took the command. "'Down behind the sandbags!' he shouted. "'If Jennings gets near enough to strike a match on this hillside, we'll all go to glory!' Sprague had predicted that if Jennings suspected trouble he would not return to the dam alone. The prediction was verified when a squad of mounted men came in view at the turn in the road leading around the hill shoulder. The moon declining to its setting behind the Timignanis flung ghostly shadows across the valley, and the watchers behind the sandbag breastwork saw only the dark blot of blacker shadows sweeping up the road. "'Give them a volley over their heads!' Sprague ordered, and the three sawed-off Winchesters barked spitefully. "'That means war!' said the colonel, when the charging cavalcade stopped abruptly and a dropping fusillade of revolver shots spat it into the sand breastwork and whined overhead. We're strictly in for it now. If those fool cowpunchers only knew what they are fighting for, they'd turn their artillery the other way, growled Starbuck. I reckon they're the Lazy X outfit, and Cummings, their owner, is one of the Highline directors. It's a pity we can't get word to them some way, said Smith. We're not out to kill anybody if we can help it. No, but they're out to kill us, granted Williams, as a second shower of bullets thudded into the breastwork and tore up the gravel on either hand. Then, what are they doing now? The defenders of the breastwork were not left long in doubt as to what was doing. The horsemen in front were deploying in a thin line which rapidly bent itself into a semicircle across the hill slope. To let any one of these skilled marksmen gain the rear meant death for somebody, and again Sprague gave the word of command. "'Better kill the horses than men,' he said. "'We've got to stop that maneuver.' And again the Winchester spoke, this time to deadlier purpose. At the third volley two of the horses were down, and the scattering line was drawing together again and galloping out of range. In the lull which succeeded, Williams dropped his weapon and crawled quickly away to the edge of the spillway torrent. When he came back, there was a new note of alarm in his voice. "'That spillway of ours is eating away the dam at a rate of a foot a minute,' he announced. "'If we can't get to work on it again, the whole business will go out with a rush.' It was a cruel dilemma, and it was quickly made worse by a new movement on the part of the attackers. Jennings's party was closing in again, and flashes of red fire were appearing here and there on the hillside to herald a dropping hail of pistol bullets. Under cover of the irregular firing, a man was worming his way down toward the edge of the ravine, through which the wasting torrent was rushing out upon the mesa. It was Sprague who first saw the crawling man and divined his purpose. "'That's Jennings!' he exclaimed. "'And if he reaches the edge of that gully, we're all dead men. Stop him, Starbuck!' Don't kill him if you can help it, but stop him! Starbuck leveled his short rifle over the top of the breastwork and took careful aim. The light was bad, and he could scarcely see the sights. At the trigger pulling, those who were watching saw a little cloud of dust and gravel spring up directly in front of the crawling man, saw this, and heard above the roaring of the torrent his yell of pain as he doubled up and clapped his hands to his face. "'Good shot, Billy!' gritted the white-haired colonel. "'You've blinded him! Now if we could only choke those crazy range-riders off! Tarbell, can't you—' "'Where's Tarbell gone?' Tarbell's place at the end of the breastwork was empty, and Smith, who was next in the line, 
accounted for him. Archer dropped out a minute or two ago. I think he's trying to make a dodge around to get at those cow punchers. The firing had ceased for the moment, and the man who had tried to creep down to the ravine was stumbling back up the hill. Williams nervously thrust his plea again. I, I tell you, we, we've got to get to work on this thing behind us and do it quick, he urged. There is still water enough in the lake to tear out the heart of the Timignani Canyon if it all goes at once. Sprague set the Timerarius example by springing to his feet, and the others followed him. There was no answering volley from the hillside. On the contrary, the black blot of things animate on the slope was melting away, and a minute later Tarble came running back. "'The boys have got their hunch,' he cried. "'A couple of them are taking Jennings back to Angles, and the rest of them will be here in a minute to help us. They didn't know what was up.' As one man, the half-dozen flung themselves upon the task of keeping the roaring crevice under control, and a little later eight of the cowmen came racing down to swell the working force. But even for the augmented numbers it proved to be a fiercely fought battle, with the issue hanging perilously in the balance for a long time. Hour by hour they toiled, making plank bulkheads out of the shack lumber, piling sandbags against the crumbling embankment, and fighting inch by inch with the gnawing flood as the night wore away. And it was thus that the graying dawn found them, soaked, muddied, gasping and haggard with fatigue, but with the victory fairly won. The flood was still pouring through the gap, which had by now widened to the cutting away of a full half of the dam, but the great body of water had already passed out, and there was no longer any danger. When the sun was just beginning to redden on the higher peaks of the western mountains, a shout from the hillside road broke upon the morning stillness. A moment later, Maxwell and Stillings came running to the brink of hazard. Sprague stumbled up out of the crevice chasm and pointed down to the washed-out heart of the dam. There, piled in the bottom of what had once been the plank-lined pit with a hoisting tackle over it, and laid bare now by the scouring flood, was a great pile of dynamite stacked solidly in its shipping boxes. And, half buried in the sand and detritus of the outflow, lay the iron pipe through which the firing fuse had been carried to the gully edge Jennings had tried to reach. There is the warrant for what we've been doing, gentlemen, said the big expert wearily. Take a good look at it, all of you, so that if the courts have anything to say about this night's work, Maxwell cut in quickly, there's nobody left to make the fight. Jennings went east from Angles on the first train that got through. He was badly blinded, so Disbrow says. Got a fall from his horse was the story he told. We'll fix this layout so it will stand, just as it is until everybody who wants to has seen it. You couldn't stay away, could you? said the white-haired colonel, grinning up from his seat on the last of the sandbags. I told the boys here you'd be turning up as soon as your railroad track was open. We've had a mighty anxious night, Stillings put in. The river is up five feet, and we couldn't tell what was happening over here. Great Jonah, but you men must have had your hands full. We did, said Smith. But it's all over now. All but the shouting, said Maxwell. But post your guards and let's get back to town. My car's at Angles and we came up special. When we left Brewster, the plaza was black with people waiting for news. It was on the way down the flood-swollen canyon that the chemistry expert explained to the private car company at the breakfast table how he had been able to diagnose the case of the cloudbursters. "'It was merely a bit of what you might call constructive reasoning,' he said modestly. "'I knew by personal investigation in the line of my proper work, soil testing, that there was no arable land within reach of the Mesquite project. The other steps followed.' as a matter of course. Starbuck here is wondering why I risked his life and mine to get a few photographs for the Tribune, but if any of you will examine the snapshots carefully under a magnifier, you will see that they prove the existence of the central pit in the dam, and that one of them shows the pipeline through which the fuse was to run. For the possible legal purpose, I was anxious to have this evidence in indisputable form. That's all, I believe. Not quite all, Maxwell broke in. 
How did you know that Jennings would be hanging over the wide angles while you people were making your flying trip across the mountain in the auto? Sprague laughed good-naturedly. <laughs> Call it a guess, he said. It was evident that Jennings wasn't anxious to kill a lot of innocent people. His inquiries about the strength of the Highline Dam proved that. It ran in my mind that he wouldn't touch off his earthquake until he could be reasonably sure that the flood wouldn't catch a train in transit in the canyon. That would have been a little too horrible, even for him. Now, you've got it all, I guess. <laughs> but you haven't got yours yet laughed Stillings. When this thing gets out in Brewster, the whole town will mob you and want to make you the next mayor, or send you to Congress, or something of that sort. Not this year, said the big man, with another mellow laugh. And I'll tell you why. Just before this train reaches town, it's going to stop and let us lawbreakers get off, scatter, and drop into town as best we can without calling attention to ourselves. And tomorrow morning you will read in the Tribune how the Mesquite Dam, weakened by the recent storms and cloudbursts, went out by littles during the night, watched over, and kept from going as a disastrous hole by a brave little bunch of— he looked around the table and winked solemnly—by a brave little bunch of cowboys from the Lazy X. Then, with sudden soberness, "'Promise me that you won't give it away, gentlemen all. "'It's the only fee I shall exact for my small part in the affair.' And the promise was given. While the locomotive whistle was sounding for the Brewster Yard limits, and Maxwell was pulling the air cord for the out-of-town stop. End of the Cloudbursters By Francis Lind Part 2